The procurator does not like Yerushalayim, the guest inquired good-naturedly. Please, the procurator exclaimed, smiling. There is no place more hopeless in the world. I won't even mention the climate. I'm ill every time I have to come here. But that's half the trouble. But these festivals, these magicians, sorcerers, wizards, these flocks of pilgrims, fanatics, fanatics. Why, take that messiah they suddenly began to await this year. At any moment you can expect to witness most unpleasant acts of bloodshed, shifting troops all the time, reading accusations and complaints, half of which are directed at you. You must agree, it is all quite boring. Oh, were it not for the imperial service. Yes, the festivals here are quite difficult, the guest agreed. I wish with all my heart that they'd be over as soon as possible, Pilate added energetically. I will finally be able to return to Caesarea. Would you believe it? But this is Herod's insane handiwork. The procurator waved at the colonnade, making it clear that he was referring to the palace. He's driving me positively mad. I cannot spend the nights here. The world has never seen stranger architecture. Yeah, but let us get back to business. First of all, is that accursed Bar Rabban giving you any trouble? Here the guest directed his peculiar stare at the procurator's cheek. But the latter was gazing off into the distance indifferently, frowning with distaste as he contemplated the part of the city lying at his feet and fading into the dusk. The guest's eyes faded as well, and his eyelids lowered. I expect that Ba is now harmless as a lamb, the guest said, and wrinkles appeared on his round face. It is rather inconvenient for him to riot now. Too famous? Pilate asked with a smirk. The procurator has subtle insight into the matter, as always. But at any rate, the procurator noted with some concern, and his long, thin finger, decorated by a ring with a black stone, rose in the air, we should... Oh, the procurator may be assured that as long as I am in Judea, Ba will not make a step without someone following on his heels. Then I am at ease, as, coincidentally, I always am with you around. The procurator is too kind. And now I will ask you to tell me about the execution, the procurator said. What in particular interests the procurator? Were there any attempts to express discontent on the part of the crowd? That's the main question, of course. None, the guest replied. Very well. You personally ascertain that the men were dead. The procurator may rest assured of it. But tell me, were they given a drink before being hung on the posts? Yes, but he... The guest closed his eyes. He refused to drink it. Who, exactly? Pilate asked. Forgive me, Hegemon, the guest exclaimed. Did I not say? Hanotsri. Madman, Pilate said, grimacing for some reason. A vein began to twitch under his left eye. To die under the scorching sun? Why refuse that which is allowed by law? How did he motivate his refusal? He said that he was grateful, the guest replied, again closing his eyes, and that he does not blame those who take away his life. Who? Pilate asked in a hollow voice. That he did not say, Hegemon. Did he attempt to preach anything in the soldier's presence? No, Hegemon, he spoke little on this occasion. The only thing he said was that he considered cowardice to be one of the main human vices. What was he referring to? The guest heard the procurator's voice crack suddenly. It was impossible to tell. He behaved strangely. As always, however. Strangely? In what way? He kept trying to look into the eyes of those around him, and kept smiling a confused sort of smile. Nothing else? asked the hoarse voice. Nothing else. The procurator banged his cup as he poured himself wine. Downing it all, he spoke. The problem is this. Although we've not been able to find any of his worshippers or followers, for the time being at least, 
We cannot assume that they do not exist. Tilting his head, the guest listened intently. Thus, to avoid any surprises, continued the procurator, I ask you to quickly and quietly remove the bodies of all three executed men from the face of the earth and bury them in secrecy and in silence so that nothing more is heard of them. I understand, Hegemon, the guest said and rose. In the light of the seriousness and complexity of the matter, please allow me to depart immediately. No, be seated a moment longer, said Pilate, stopping his guest with a gesture. There are two more questions. The first is this. Your outstanding service, in a most difficult position as overseer of the secret service for the procurator of Judea, affords me the pleasant opportunity to mention you in Rome. The guest's face turned pink. He rose and bowed to the procurator, saying, I only fulfil my duty in the imperial service. But I would like to ask you, the hegemon continued, to refuse a promotional transfer if one is offered to you and remain here. I would hate to part with you. Let them reward you in some other way. I am happy to serve under your command, hegemon. I'm very pleased. And thus the second question concerning this, uh, what's his face, Judas of Kiriot. The guest directed his stare at the procurator and promptly extinguished it as before. They say, continued the procurator, lowering his voice, that he received money for his warm reception of that mad philosopher. Will receive the overseer of the secret service corrected quietly. Is it a large sum? That no one knows, Hegemon. Not even you, asked the Hegemon, expressing a compliment with his amazement. Alas, not even I, the guest replied calmly. But I do know that he will receive this money tonight. He is being summoned to Caifa's palace. Ah, that greedy old man from Kiriot, said the procurator, smiling. He is an old man, is he not? The procurator never errs, but this time he has, the guest replied amiably. The man from Kiriot is a young man. You don't say. Can you describe him for me? A fanatic? Not at all, procurator. Right. Anything else? Very handsome. What else? Perhaps he has some passion or another? It is difficult to know everyone so well in this enormous city, Procurator. No, no, Aphronius, don't play down your merits. He has one passion, Procurator. The guest made the tiniest of pauses. Passion for money. Hmm, what does he do? Aphranius raised his eyes to the ceiling, thought, and answered, He works at a money-changer's shop owned by one of his relatives. Right, right, right. The procurator fell silent, glanced round to make sure there was no one else on the balcony, and said quietly, Here's the thing. I have received information that he will be murdered tonight. At this point, not only did the guest cast his glance at the procurator, but even held it for a little while, and then replied, You speak too kindly of me, procurator. It seems I do not deserve your favourable report. I have no such information. You deserve the highest reward, replied the procurator. But the information exists. If I may be so bold as to ask, where does this information come from? Allow me to withhold that from you for the moment, especially since it is all quite accidental, obscure, and unreliable. However, it is my duty to foresee all. It is my job, and furthermore, I am inclined to trust my instincts, as they have never misled me in the past. The information consists of this. One of Hanotsuri's secret followers, 
outraged at this money changer's monstrous betrayal. He's conspiring with his accomplices to kill him tonight. As for the payment received for the betrayal, it will be brought back to Kaifa along with a note. I return the cursed money. The overseer of the Secret Service cast no more of his unexpected glances at the procurator and continued listening with narrowed eyes as Pilate continued. Imagine, would the high priest enjoy receiving such a gift on the night of the festival? Not only would he not enjoy it, replied the guest, smiling, but I believe it would cause quite the scandal, procurator. I am of the same opinion. As a result, I ask you to attend to this matter, that is, take all the necessary measures to protect Judas of Kiriot. The hegemon's orders will be carried out, Ephraenia said. But permit me to allay the hegemon's fears. The villain's plot will be quite difficult to pull off. Just think, the guest glanced round as he spoke and continued, to seek out a man, kill him, find out how much money he has received, and manage to return the sum to Kaifa all in one night, tonight, and nonetheless he will be killed tonight, Pilate repeated stubbornly. I can feel it, I tell you. Not once have I been wrong. A spasm passed over the procurator's face, and he rubbed his hands briefly. Understood, the guest replied obediently. He rose, straightened himself, and asked sternly. So they will kill him, Hegemon? Yes, Pilate replied. The only hope lies in your amazing abilities. The guest adjusted his heavy belt under his cloak and said, I salute you and wish you good health and happiness. Oh, yes, Pilate exclaimed quietly. I almost forgot. I owe you. The guest was amazed. Truly, Procurator, you owe me nothing. I certainly do. When we rode into Yerushalayim, if you recall, the crowd of beggars. I wanted to throw some money at them, but had none on my person, so I borrowed from you. Why, it's a trifle, Procurator. Even trifles ought to be remembered. Pilate turned round and picked up a cloak from the seat behind him. He extracted a leather bag from underneath it and handed it to his guest. The latter bowed as he accepted it and hid it under his cloak. I await your report on the burial, said Pilate, as well as regarding the matter of this Judas of Kiriot. This same night, do you hear me, Ephraimus? This same night, the guards will be instructed to wake me as soon as you arrive. I'll be waiting for you. I salute you, the overseer of the secret service said, and turned to leave the balcony. His feet crunched on the wet sand of the terrace, then came the tapping of his boots on the marble steps between the lions. His legs disappeared from sight, followed by his torso, and finally his head. Only then did the procurator notice that the sun was gone and the twilight had come. Chapter 26 The Burial Perhaps it was the twilight that caused such an abrupt change in the procurator's appearance. He seemed to grow old and hunched. Moreover, he became anxious. At one point he looked around and shuddered, glancing at the empty chair with a cloak draped over its back. The night of the festival drew near, the evening shadows were playing their usual tricks, and the tired procurator probably imagined that someone was sitting in the empty chair. After yielding momentarily to weakness and prodding the cloak, the procurator left it alone and began pacing round the balcony. He would rub his hands together. He would run to the table and grasp his cup. He would stop and stare senselessly at the mosaic of the floor, as if trying to make out some characters in it. For the second time that day, he was overcome with melancholy. Rubbing his temple, where but a dull, dimly aching reminder of the morning's infernal pain yet lingered, the procurator strived to establish the cause of his mental anguish. And he quickly understood what it was, but he still tried to deceive himself. 
It was clear to him that he had irretrievably lost something that day, and was now trying to make up for it with petty, insignificant, and above all belated actions. The self-deception consisted of the fact that the procurator was trying to impress upon himself that his actions that evening were no less important than the sentence he had pronounced that morning. But the procurator had considerable trouble succeeding in this endeavour. On one of his turns, he stopped abruptly and whistled. A low bark responded from the shadows, and a gigantic, sharp-eared dog with a grey coat jumped onto the balcony from the garden, sporting a gold-studded collar. Banger! Banger! The procurator cried out weakly. The dog rose on his hind paws, placed his front ones on his master's shoulders, nearly knocking him to the floor, and licked his cheek. The procurator sat down in his chair. Putting out his tongue and panting, Banger lay down by his master's feet, his eyes expressing happiness at the ending of the storm. The only thing in the world that frightened the fearless dog, as well as the fact that he was once again near the man he loved, respected and considered the most powerful in the world, ruler of all men, thanks to which the dog also considered himself a privileged, elevated, and otherwise special creature. But as he lay at the procurator's feet, without even glancing at him, looking out instead into the twilight garden, the dog immediately knew that trouble had befallen his master. Therefore he shifted, got up, approached from the side, and placed his head and front paws onto the procurator's knees, smearing wet sand on his cloak. Banger's actions likely indicated that he was consoling his master and was ready to face any misfortune along with him. This sentiment was expressed both in his eyes that peered sideways at his master and in his alert, pricked-up ears. Thus, together, the man and the dog who loved each other met the holiday night on the balcony. Meanwhile, the procurator's guest was very busy. Leaving the upper platform of the garden in front of the balcony, he descended the stairs to the next terrace, turned right and exited towards the barracks located on the palace grounds. It was here that the two sentries that accompanied the procurator to Yerushalayim for the festival were quartered, in addition to the procurator's secret guard, commanded by his guest. The guest spent very little time in the barracks, no more than ten minutes, but when the ten minutes were up, three wagons rolled out of the barracks courtyard, loaded with entrenching tools and a barrel of water. Fifteen riders, wearing grey cloaks, were escorting the wagons. In their company, the wagons left the palace grounds through the rear gate and headed west through the gates in the city wall. They took the path to the Bethlehem Road, then headed north to the intersection by Hevron Gate, and finally rode off down the Jaffa Road, where the execution procession had passed in the daytime. It was already dark, and the moon appeared on the horizon. Soon after the wagons left with their escorting unit, the procurator's guest also departed the palace grounds on horseback, after changing into a dark, worn chiton. Rather than heading out of town, however, he ventured deeper into the city. A short while later, he could be seen approaching the fortress of Antonia, located directly north of the great temple. The guest did not stay long at the fortress either, and soon his trail resurfaced in the lower city, in its twisted and tangled streets. He was now riding a mule. The guest knew the city well and easily found the street he needed. It was known as Greek Street, as there were several Greek shops on it, including one that sold carpets. It was by that shop that the guest stopped his mule, dismounted, and tied the animal to a ring near the gate. The shop was already closed. The guest passed through a small gate beside the entrance to the shop and found himself in a small square courtyard surrounded on three sides by sheds. Turning a corner the guest approached the stone terrace of a house covered in ivy. He surveyed his surroundings. The house and the sheds were dark, the lights had not yet been lit. The guest called out quietly, Nitsa! 
A door creaked at his call, and a young woman without a veil appeared on the terrace in the evening twilight. She bent over the railing, peering anxiously into the darkness, trying to see who had come. Recognising the visitor, she smiled amicably at him, nodded her head and waved. Are you alone? Afranius asked quietly in Greek. Alone? the woman on the terrace whispered. My husband left for Caesarea this morning. Then she glanced back at the door and added in a whisper, But the maid is home. She gestured for Afranius to come in. He looked round and ascended the stone steps. Then both he and the woman disappeared inside the house. Afranius spent very little time here, no more than five minutes, after which he left the house and the terrace, pulled the hood over his eyes, and went out into the street. The lights were already being lit in the houses, the pre-festival rush was still going strong, and Afranius and his mule blended into the crowd of pedestrians and riders. His subsequent path is unknown. As for the woman that Afranius called Nitsa, left alone, she immediately began to change, and in a great hurry at that. Yet, no matter how difficult it was to find the things she needed in the dark room, she would not light a lamp or call the maid. Only when she was ready, and wearing a dark veil over her head, did she say, If anyone asks for me, tell them I went over to Enantas. The elderly maid grumbled in the dark. Enanta? Why, that Enanta, your husband forbade you to visit her. She's a procuress, that Enanta. I ought to tell your husband. All right, all right, be quiet, Nitsa replied, and slipped outside like a shadow, her sandals tapping on the stones of the courtyard. Still grumbling, the maid shut the terrace door. Nitsa left the house. At the same time, in a different street of the lower city, a broken alley with ledges opening on one of the city pools, a young man with a neatly trimmed beard emerged from the gate of an unsightly house its blank wall facing the street and its windows looking out into the courtyard. He wore a clean white kaffir falling to his shoulders, a new blue holiday talus with tassels at the bottom and creaking brand new sandals. Dressed up for the great festival, the handsome hook-nosed man walked briskly, passing other pedestrians as they hurried home for the holiday meal and watching one window light up after another. The young man took the road leading past the market to the palace of the high priest Kaifa, located at the base of the Temple Mount. Sometime later, he could be seen entering the gates to Kaifa's courtyard, and in another short while, he left by the same way he came. After visiting the palace, already blazing with lights and torches, and bustling with holiday activity, the young man began to walk even more briskly, even more happily, and hurried back to the lower city. At the corner where the street entered the market square, a woman overtook him, walking with a light, almost dancing gait amid the boiling crowd, her black veil lowered over her eyes. Passing by, she raised her veil momentarily and cast a glance at the young man. Only she did not slow down, but instead began to walk faster, as if trying to run away from the one she had just passed. Not only did the young man notice the woman, but he recognized her. And, having recognized, he gave a start, halted, gazing after her in confusion, and then immediately gave chase. Almost knocking over some passerby with a jug in his hands, the young man caught up to the woman and, panting, called out, Nitsa! The woman turned, narrowed her eyes, her face expressing cold annoyance, and replied dryly in Greek, Oh, is that you, Judas? I did not recognize you right away. That is good, though. We have a belief that when someone is not recognized, it's a sign that he will get rich. So excited that his heart began fluttering like a bird trapped under a dark cloth, Judas asked in a halting whisper, afraid that others would hear, where are you going, Nitsa? Why do you want to know? asked Nitsa, slowing down and gazing haughtily at Judas. Almost childlike overtones crept into Judas's voice as he whispered in confusion. But what about? 
I thought we had agreed. I wanted to stop by. You said you would be home all night. Oh, no, no, Nitsu replied and pouted her lower lip capriciously. To Judas, it seemed that this made her face the prettiest face he had seen in his entire life even prettier. I was bored. You people have a festival, and what would you have me do? Sit on the terrace and listen to you sigh, and worry that the maid will tell my husband as well? No. No, I decided to go out of town and listen to the nightingales. Out of town? Judas asked, bewildered. Alone? Of course alone, Nitsa replied. Let me come with you, Judas implored breathlessly. His head clouded, he had forgotten all else, and was now looking pleadingly into Nitsa's blue eyes. They appeared black in the darkness. Nitsa said nothing and picked up speed. Why won't you answer me, Nitsa? Judas asked pitifully, matching her pace. What if I am bored with you? Nitsa asked suddenly and stopped. Judas's thoughts became utterly jumbled. Well, all right. Nitsa softened at last. Let's go. But where? Where? Wait. Let's step into that courtyard and arrange it. I'm afraid someone I know may notice me, and then say I was seen outside with a lover. Nitsa and Judas vanished from the marketplace. They were whispering in the gateway of a house. Come to the olive groves, Nitsa whispered pulling the veil over her eyes and turning away from some man who was passing through the gate carrying a bucket. To Gethsemane, over the Kidron, understand? Yes, yes, yes. I will go first, Nitsa continued. But don't follow on my heels. Put some distance between us. I will go faster. When you cross the stream, do you know where the grotto is? I do, I do. Go past the olive press and head for the grotto. I will be there. But don't you dare follow right after me. Have patience and wait here. With these words, Nitsa walked away from the gate, as though she had never spoken to Judas. Judas stood alone for a while, trying to gather his scattering thoughts. Among them was the question of how he would explain his absence from the holiday meal to his family. Judas stood there, inventing a lie, but could not think it through in his excitement. And then his legs carried him out onto the street all on their own. He changed his course and headed back towards Caifa's palace instead of into the lower city. Judas paid little attention to his surroundings. The festival had descended upon the city. The windows around Judas were brightly lit, and sounds of prayer came from inside. Latecomers urged on their donkeys, whipping them and shouting, Judas's legs seemed to carry him of their own accord, and he even failed to notice the hideous mossy towers of the Antonia as they floated by, failed to hear the roaring of trumpets inside the fortress, paid no attention to a mounted Roman patrol whose lit torches flooded his path with disturbing light. Passing the tower, Judas turned and saw two gigantic, five-branched candlesticks light up at a dizzying height over the temple. But even these were a blur to Judas. He perceived them as ten lamps of unprecedented size that lit up over Yerushalayim, rivaling the light of the solitary lamp that climbed higher and higher over the city, the moon. Judas had but one purpose now as he headed for the Gethsemane gates. He wished to leave the city as quickly as possible. At times he thought he saw a small dancing figure among the faces and backs of pedestrians leading him on, but it was an illusion. Judas knew that Nitsa was far ahead of him. Judas ran past the money-changing shops and finally reached the Gethsemane gates. There, burning with impatience, he was nonetheless forced to wait. Camels were entering the city, followed by a Syrian military patrol, which Judas mentally cursed. But everything has an end. The impatient Judas was already beyond the city wall. On his left, he saw a small cemetery with several striped pilgrims' tents next to it. Crossing a dusty, moonlit road, Judas headed for the streams of the Kidron, aiming to cross them. The water babbled quietly under Judas's feet. Hopping from stone to stone, he finally reached the opposite, 
Gethsemane Bank, and was overjoyed to see that the road overlooking the orchards was deserted. He could already see the half-broken gates of the olive grove nearby. After the stuffy city air, Judas was struck by the overpowering scent of the spring night. A wave of myrtle and acacia from the Gethsemane glades was pouring over the garden wall. The gateway was unguarded. There was no one in it, and in a few minutes Judas was running in the mysterious shadows of the enormous branchy olive trees. The road led uphill. Judas ascended, breathing heavily, occasionally stepping out of the darkness onto ornate carpets of moonlight. They reminded him of the carpets he saw in the shop belonging to Nitza's jealous husband. A short while later, Judas glimpsed the olive press in a clearing on his left, with a heavy stone wheel and a pile of barrels next to it. The grove was empty. Work had ceased at dusk. There was not a soul in the garden, and nightingale choirs sang exuberantly over Judas's head. His aim was close. He knew that he would soon hear the quiet whisper of water falling in the grotto to his right, and hear it he did. The air grew cooler. He slowed down and called out quietly, Nitza. But instead of Nitza, a stocky male figure peeled off from the thick trunk of an olive tree and jumped onto the road. Something flashed in its hand and extinguished immediately. Judas drew back and cried out weakly. Ha! A second man blocked his path. How much did you just receive? The first man asked Judas. Speak, if you wish to save your life. A glimmer of hope appeared in Judas's heart. He cried desperately. Thirty tetradrachmas! Thirty tetradrachmas! It's all here! Here's the money! Take it, but let me live! The man in front snatched the purse instantly from Judas's hands. At the same time, a knife flew up behind the would-be lover's back and struck him under the shoulder blade. Judas was flung forward, his hands thrusting out, fingers clutching at the air. The man in front caught Judas on the blade of his own knife, plunging it to the hilt into his heart. Nitza! Judas spoke, his high, clear, youthful voice replaced by a low, reproachful one, and made no other sound. His body fell so hard that the ground resonated. Then a third figure appeared on the road. This third character wore a hooded cloak. Don't dally, he ordered. The killers quickly wrapped the purse in leather, along with a note handed to them by the third man, and tied it with a rope. The second man put the bundle down his shirt, and then both killers dashed from the road in different directions, and the darkness consumed them among the olives. The third squatted by the dead man and looked him in the face. In the shadows it appeared white as chalk and somehow spiritually beautiful. A few moments later no living man remained on the road. The breathless body lay with arms outstretched. Its left foot fell in a spot of moonlight so that every strap of the sandal was clearly visible. Nightingales filled the Gethsemane gardens with their singing. The trail of Judas's two killers vanishes here, but the path of the third hooded man is known. Leaving the road, he headed into the thick of the olive trees, making his way south. He climbed over the wall of the garden in its southernmost corner, far from the main gate, in the spot where the top stones of the masonry had fallen out. Soon, he was on the shore of the Kidron. He entered the water and waded for some time until he saw the silhouettes of two horses and a man next to them. The horses were also standing in the stream, the water washing over their hooves. The horse handler mounted one of the horses and the hooded man jumped on the other. Slowly they went along the stream bed, the pebbles crunching under the horses' hooves. 
Eventually, the riders left the water, climbed up the bank to Yerushalayim, and pressed onward at a walk beneath the city wall. Then the horse handler galloped ahead and vanished from sight, while the hooded man stopped his horse and dismounted on the deserted road. He removed his cloak, turned it inside out, extracted a flat, undecorated helmet from the folds, and put it on. Mounting his horse, he was now a man in a military clamis, a short sword on his hip. He picked up the reins, and the fiery cavalry horse trotted off, jerking the rider. His destination was nearby. The rider was approaching the south gate of Yerushalayim. Restless torch flames danced and leaped beneath the arch of the gateway. Guards from the second century of the Lightning Legion were sitting on stone benches playing dice. Seeing the officer approach, the soldiers jumped up. The officer waved to them and rode into the city. Yerushalayim was flooded with festival lights. Lamps flickered in every window, and the sounds of prayer came from all directions, forming a dissonant chorus. Looking occasionally into windows facing the street, the rider could see people sitting at holiday dinner tables laden with goat's meat and cups of wine amid plates of bitter herbs. Quietly whistling some tune, the rider made his way through the deserted streets of the lower city at a leisurely trot, heading for the Antonia Tower, glancing every now and again at the extraordinary five-branched candlesticks burning over the temple or at the moon, which stood even higher. The palace of Herod the Great did not participate in the Passover celebration. Lights were lit in the auxiliary chambers at the south end of the palace, where the officers of the Roman cohort and the legate of the legion were quartered, giving evidence of movement and life. But the front of the palace, containing its single, involuntary occupant, the procurator, looked like it had been blinded by the bright moonlight along with all its colonnades and golden statues. Here, inside the palace, darkness and silence reigned. The procurator chose not to retreat indoors, just as he told Afranius. He ordered his bed to be made on the balcony, in the same spot where he had dined and where he had conducted the morning interrogation. The procurator lay down on the prepared couch, but sleep would not come to him. The bare moon hung high up in the clear sky, and the procurator stared at it for hours. At approximately midnight, sleep finally took pity on the hegemon. Yawning spasmodically, the procurator unfastened his cloak and threw it off. He removed the belt he wore over his shirt, with a broad, sheathed steel blade, laid it onto a chair nearby, took off his sandals, and stretched out on the couch. Banger immediately climbed up on the bed and lay down next to him, head to head. Placing his arm on the dog's neck, the procurator finally closed his eyes. Only then did the dog also fall asleep. The couch stood partially in the shadows, shielded from the moon by a column but a band of moonlight stretched from the stairs all the way to the bed. And as soon as the procurator lost contact with his physical surroundings, he immediately set off down the shining path straight towards the moon. In his sleep, he even burst out in joyous laughter. So wonderful and unique was his journey up the transparent blue road. He was accompanied by Banga, and the wandering philosopher also walked next to him. They were discussing something very complex and important, and neither one could win the argument. They could not agree on any point, making the debate all the more interesting and endless. Naturally, today's execution had been a pure misunderstanding. The philosopher, who had thought up the ridiculous notion that all men were good, was walking next to him, after all, and therefore alive. Indeed, it would have been horrible to even consider executing such a man. The execution never happened. Never. Therein lay the beauty of the journey up the lunar stairway. They had as much time as they needed, and the storm would only come towards the evening, and cowardice was undoubtedly one of the worst sins. 
Thus spoke Yeshua Hanotzri. Nay, philosopher, I disagree. It is the worst sin of all. Take the present procurator of Judea, former tribune of a legion. He was no coward back in the Valley of the Virgins, when the fierce Germans nearly cut the giant rat-slayer to pieces. But have mercy, philosopher. Surely a man of your intelligence would not suggest that the procurator of Judea would ruin his career for a man who had committed a crime against Caesar? Yes, yes, Pilate sobbed and moaned in his sleep. Of course he would. He would not that morning, but tonight, after weighing everything, he would. He would do anything to save that utterly innocent madman, dreamer, and healer from execution. Now we shall always be together, spoke the ragged, wandering philosopher who had incredibly crossed paths with the Knight of the Golden Lance. Where one goes, so shall the other. Where I am mentioned, so shall you be too. I, a foundling, son of unknown parents, and you, son of an astrologer king and a miller's daughter, the beautiful Pila. Yes, don't you forget this astrologer's son, Pilate implored in his dream. And receiving a nod from the beggar of Ensarid, the cruel procurator of Judea, laughed and wept for joy as he slept. But the better the dream, the more dreadful was the hegemon's awakening. Banger growled at the moon, and the slippery, almost oily blue road collapsed before the procurator. He opened his eyes, and the first thing he remembered was that the execution had indeed occurred. The procurator grasped Banger's collar with a habitual motion, then sought out the moon with aching eyes, and saw that it had moved slightly aside and turned silvery. Its light was broken by an unpleasant, disturbing flame flickering directly in front of him on the balcony. A torch burned and gave off smoke in the centurion rat-slayer's hand. The owner of the hand glared fearfully and spitefully at the dangerous beast poised to strike. Stay, Vanga, the procurator said in a sickly voice and coughed. Shielding himself from the light with his hand, he continued, Even at night, by moonlight, I have no peace. Oh, gods, you too have an unpleasant duty, Mark. You cripple soldiers. Mark stared at the procurator with great amazement, and the latter collected himself. To smooth over the unnecessarily harsh words, spoken while half awake, the procurator said, do not be offended, Centurion. I repeat, my own position is far worse. What is it? The head of the secret guard is here, Mark informed calmly. Send him in, send him in, the procurator ordered, clearing his throat with a cough and feeling for his sandals with his bare feet. The flame played on the columns, and the Centurion's caligae rang out on the mosaic as he went out into the garden. Even by moonlight I have no peace, the procurator said to himself, gnashing his teeth. The hooded man replaced the centurion on the balcony. Stay, Banger, the procurator said quietly and squeezed the dog's neck. As was his custom, Afranius looked around and peered into the shadows before he spoke, making sure no other parties were present on the balcony except for Banger. I request to be court-martialed, Procurator. You were right. I failed to protect Judas of Kiriat, and he was murdered. I request a court-martial and a resignation. It seemed to Aphronius that two pairs of eyes were staring at him, a dog's and a wolf's. Aphronius produced a blood-encrusted purse from under his clamis. It was sealed with two seals. The killers left this bag of money at the high priest's house. The blood on the bag belongs to Judas of Kiriat. How much is in there, I wonder? 
asked Pilot, leaning towards the bag. Thirty tetradrachmas. The procurator sneered and said, Not much. Afranius said nothing. Where is the body? This I do not know, the man who never parted with his hood said with calm dignity. We will begin the search in the morning. The procurator gave a start and abandoned his sandal strap, which refused to fasten. But you are certain he was killed? To this, the procurator received the following dry response. I have worked in Judea for fifteen years, procurator. I commenced my service under Valerius Gratus. I need not see a corpse to know that a man has been killed, and I tell you that he who was named Judas of Kiriat was murdered several hours ago. Forgive me, Ephranius, Pilate replied. I only said that because I had not fully awakened. I have trouble sleeping. The procurator grinned. And I keep seeing this moonbeam in my dreams. It's quite amusing, really, as though I am walking on the moonbeam. Anyway, I would like to hear your thoughts on the case. Where do you intend to look for him? Sit down, overseer of the Secret Service. Afranius bowed, moved a chair closer to the bed, and sat down, his sword clanging. I intended to look for him near the olive press in the Gethsemane garden. Right, right. Why there? If my theory is correct, Hegemon, Judas was not killed in Jerusalem, but he was not killed far from the city either. He was killed somewhere close to the city. I consider you one of the foremost experts in your field. I am not certain of the situation in Rome, but in the colonies you have no equal. Explain. How did you arrive at this conclusion? I would not believe for a moment, Ephraim said quietly, that Judas would let himself fall into the hands of suspicious people within city limits. It is impossible to kill someone quietly on the street. Therefore, he would have to have been lured into some cellar. However, the guards have already looked for him in the lower city and would have undoubtedly found him. If he had been killed far from the city, the bag of money could not have been delivered so soon. He was killed near the city. Someone managed to lure him out there. I cannot imagine how that could have been done. Yes, Procurator, it is the most difficult question in the entire case, and I am not certain I will be able to answer it. Indeed, how puzzling! A religious man abandons the Passover meal, goes out of town on the night of the festival for reasons unknown, and perishes there. Who could have lured him out, and how? The procurator suddenly had an inspiration. Perhaps a woman has done this. Afranius replied calmly and authoritatively. Never, procurator. That possibility is completely ruled out. Let us think logically. Who was interested in Judas's death? Some small circle of wandering mystics, which first and foremost could not possibly have included any women. One needs money in order to marry, Procurator. One needs it to bring a person into the world. But one needs very large amounts of money to kill a man with the aid of a woman. Vagrants have no money, and thus there were no women involved in this, Procurator. I will even go a step further and add that such an interpretation of the murder can only throw us off track, impede the investigation, and confuse me. I see you are absolutely right, Afranius, Pilate said. I was merely allowing myself to express a theory. Alas, Procurator, it is incorrect. But what then? The procurator exclaimed, peering into Afranius's face with voracious curiosity. I suspect that the reason was, again, money. An excellent idea. But who could have offered him money at night outside the city, and what for? Oh, no, procurator, not that. I have but one theory, and if it turns out to be wrong, I fear I shall not find another explanation. Afranius leaned closer to the procurator 
and finished in a whisper. Judas wanted to hide the money in some secluded spot known only to himself. A very shrewd explanation. This was most probably the case. I understand now. It was not people who lured him out, but his own intent, yes. Yes, it must have been so. Right. Judas was mistrustful. He hid his money from people. Yes. And you mentioned Gethsemane. Why is it that you plan to look for him there? I confess I do not understand. Oh. That was the simplest conclusion of all, Procurator. No one would hide money on the roads, in open or empty places. Judas did not take the road to Hebron or Bethany. He had to be in a protected, secluded spot with many trees. It is quite trivial. Gethsemane is the only such place in the vicinity of Yerushalayim, and he could not have gone far. You have convinced me fully. So, what shall we do now? I shall immediately begin to look for the killers who followed Judas out of the city, and in the meantime, as I have already stated, I will submit myself to a court-martial. What for? My guards lost him in the marketplace after he left Caiaphas' palace in the evening. I cannot understand how. This has never happened to me before. He was placed under surveillance immediately following our conversation, but near the marketplace he doubled back somehow, made a strange loop, and vanished without a trace. Right. I decree that I do not find it necessary to court-martial you. You did all you could, and no one in the world, here the procurator smiled, could have done more. Reprimand the men who lost Judas, but even here, I warn you, I do not want the punishment to be especially harsh. After all, we did everything we could to take care of that scoundrel. Oh, and I wanted to ask you. The procurator wiped his forehead. How did they manage to get the money to Caifa? You see, procurator, it was not particularly difficult. The Avengers approached Caifa's palace from behind, where an alley sits on higher ground overlooking the rear courtyard. They threw the package over the fence. With a note? Yes, just as you suspected, Procurator. Oh, by the way, Afranius removed the seals from the package and showed its contents to Pilate. Good heavens, what are you doing, Afranius? Those must be temple seals. The Procurator need not concern himself with this, Afranius replied, closing the package. "'Surely you don't mean to say you have copies of all the seals?' Pilate asked, laughing. "'It would be unthinkable not to, Procurator,' Afranius replied very seriously, without a hint of mirth. "'I can imagine what must have taken place at Caiaphas.' "'Yes, Procurator. The incident caused quite a stir. They summoned me immediately.' Even in the darkness it was possible to see Pilate's eyes flash. "'Interesting.' Interesting. I beg pardon, Procurator. It was not interesting in the least. A most boring and exhausting affair. When I asked whether anyone in Caifa's palace had given out that money, the reply was a categorical no. No, ah, really. Well, no means no. The harder it will be to find the killers. Quite right, Procurator. I suddenly had an idea, Afranius. What if he committed suicide? Oh, no, Procurator, Afranius replied, leaning back in his chair in astonishment. Forgive me, but that is completely impossible. Bah, anything is possible in this city. I bet that rumours of this will begin to spread through the city very soon. Afranius cast his glance at the Procurator, thought a while, and replied, That could very well be, Procurator. As for the procurator, he evidently could not bring himself to leave the subject of the murder of the man from Kiryat, even though everything had already been made clear. I would have wanted to see how they killed him, he said somewhat wistfully. He was killed with great finesse, procurator, Afranius replied, gazing at Pilate with a degree of irony. 
How do you know that? If you would be so kind as to pay attention to the bag, Procurator, Afranius replied, I wager that Judas's blood gushed like a river. I have seen many a murdered man in my time, Procurator. I take it he will not rise again. No, Procurator, he will rise, Afranius replied, smiling philosophically. When their Messiah's trumpet sounds over him, he will rise, but no sooner. Enough, Afranius. This matter is settled. Let us move on to the burial. The executed men have been buried, Procurator? Afranius, it would be a crime to have you court-martialed. You deserve the highest reward. How did it happen? Afranius explained that while he was personally attending to Judas, a detachment of the secret guard, headed by his assistant, reached the hill close to nightfall. One of the bodies was missing from the hilltop. The pilot shuddered and said hoarsely, Ah, how did I not foresee it? No need to worry, Procurator, Afranius said and continued his narrative. The men picked up the bodies of Dismas and Hestas, their eyes pecked out by ravenous birds, and immediately went off in search of the third body. It was located very quickly. A certain man, Matthew Levi, the procurator said. It was more of an affirmation than a question. Yes, procurator. Matthew Levi was hiding in a cave on the northern slope of the bald mountain, waiting for darkness. The naked body of Yeshua Hanotzri was with him. When the guards entered the cave with torches, Levi fell into despair and anger. He screamed that he had committed no crime, and that any man, according to the law, had the right to bury an executed criminal if he so desired. Matthew Levi said that he did not wish to part with the body. He was agitated. He rambled incoherently, pleading one moment, threatening and cursing the next. Did they have to seize him? Pilate asked grimly. No, Procurator, no, Afranius replied very soothingly. They managed to calm the insolent madman after explaining that the body was about to be buried. Levi quieted down as he thought it over, but then announced that he refused to leave and wished to take part in the burial. He said he would not leave, even if it meant death, and actually offered a bread knife to kill him with. Was he sent away? Pilate asked in a stifled voice. No, Procurator, no. My assistant allowed him to participate in the burial. Which of your assistants was in charge? Pilate inquired. Tolmai, replied Afranius, and added anxiously, Perhaps he has made a mistake? Go on, Pilate replied. There was no mistake. In fact, I am somewhat at a loss, Afranius, as I am evidently dealing with a man who never makes mistakes. That man is you. Matthew Levi was placed in a wagon, along with the bodies of the executed men, and in about two hours they reached a deserted canyon north of Yerushalayim. Working in shifts, the crew took an hour to dig a deep hole, then buried all three executed men in it. Naked? No, Procurator. My crew brought chitons for this purpose. Rings were placed on the fingers of the men, Yeshua's ring had one notch, Dismas's had two, and Hestus's had three. The pit was filled and covered with stones. Tolmai knows the landmark. Ah, if only I had foreseen it, Pilate spoke, frowning. I needed to see this Matthew Levi. He is here, Procurator. Pilate opened his eyes wide and stared at Afranius for some time. Finally... He spoke thus. I thank you for all your efforts in connection with this matter. Please send Tolmai to me tomorrow, and tell him in advance that I am pleased with him. As for you, Afranius, the procurator took out a ring from the pocket of his belt, which was lying on the table, and handed it to the overseer of the secret service. Please accept this as a token of my gratitude. 
Afranius bowed and said, It is a great honour, Procurator. The squad that worked on the burial is to be rewarded. The men who lost Judas, reprimanded. And send in Matthew Levi right away. I need some details on Yeshua's case. I understand, Procurator, Afranius replied, and began to retreat and bow. The Procurator clapped his hands and shouted, Over here! Bring a lamp to the colonnade! Afranius was already on his way to the garden, and lights were twinkling in the servants' hands behind Pilate's back. Three lamps appeared on the table before the Procurator, and the moonlit night retreated into the garden, as if Afranius had taken it with him. Instead of Afranius, a small, thin, unknown man stepped onto the balcony, accompanied by the giant centurion. Catching the procurator's glance, the latter retreated immediately into the garden and disappeared. The procurator studied the visitor with hungry, yet somewhat frightened eyes. Thus we look at someone who we have heard and thought of a lot, and who has finally arrived. The visitor was around forty years old, dark, ragged, and covered in dried mud. He had a distrustful, wolf-like stare. In short, he was most unsightly and resembled a city beggar, such as the many found loitering on the temple terraces or in the marketplaces of the loud and filthy lower city. The silence continued for a long time, and then was interrupted by the visitor's strange behaviour. The man's face changed, he staggered, and would have fallen had he not grasped the edge of the table with his dirty hand. "'What's wrong with you?' Pilate asked him. "'Nothing,' Matthew Levi replied and made a swallowing motion. His thin, bare, dirty neck bulged, then flattened again. "'What's wrong with you, speak?' Pilate repeated. "'I am tired.' Levi replied, staring grimly at the floor. Sit down, Pilate spoke, gesturing towards the chair. Levi glanced at the procurator suspiciously, moved towards the chair, took a quick, frightened look at the gilded armrests, and sat down on the floor next to the chair instead. Would you care to explain why you did not sit in the chair? Pilate asked. I am dirty. I would sully it, Levi said, staring at the ground. You will be brought something to eat. I do not want to eat, Levi replied. Why lie? Pilate asked quietly. You have not eaten all day, perhaps longer. But very well, it's your choice. I called you here so you could show me the knife you had with you. The soldiers took it away when they brought me here. Levi replied, and added grimly, Give it back to me. I need to return it to the shop owner. I stole it. Why? To cut the ropes, Levi replied. Mark! shouted the procurator, and the centurion stepped under the columns. Give me his knife. The centurion produced a dirty bread knife from one of the two compartments on his belt, handed it to the procurator, and left. Where did you get the knife? In a bread shop near the Hevron Gate, directly on the left as you enter the city. Pilate looked at the broad blade, tested its sharpness with his finger, and said, Do not worry about the knife. It will be returned to the shop. Now I need something else. Show me the parchment you carry with Yeshua's words recorded on it. Levi glared hatefully at Pilate, and smiled a smile so unkind that his face turned utterly repulsive. "'You want to take it all away? My last possession?' he asked. "'I did not say, give,' Pilate replied. "'I said, show.' Levi fumbled in his shirt and took out a roll of parchment. Pilate took it, opened it, and laid it out by the light. Squinting, he began to study the barely legible ink markings. 
It was difficult to understand these crooked lines of text, and Pilate frowned as he leaned over the parchment and traced them with his finger. He managed to determine that the writing consisted of an incoherent chain of sayings, dates, housekeeping records, and poetic fragments. Pilate managed to read, There is no death. Yesterday we ate sweet spring figs. Wincing with strain, Pilate squinted and read, We shall see the pure river of the water of life. Mankind shall look at the sun through transparent crystal. Pilate gave a start. In the last lines of the parchment he recognized the words, No greater sin. Cowardice. Pilate rolled up the parchment and handed it to Levi with a brusque motion. Take it, he said. After a brief silence, he added, I see you are a man of books. There is no need for you to walk around alone, in beggar's garb, without shelter. I have a large library in Caesarea. I am very wealthy, and would like to take you into my service. You will sort and take care of the papyri. You will be well clothed and fed. Levi rose and replied, No, I do not want to. Why? asked the procurator, his face darkening. Am I unpleasant to you? Are you afraid of me? The same unsightly smile distorted Levi's face, and he said, No, because you would be afraid of me. You would not find it so easy to look me in the face after you killed him. Silence, Pilate replied. Take some money. Levi shook his head, and the procurator continued, I know you consider yourself to be a disciple of Yeshua, but let me tell you that you have learned nothing of what he taught you, for if you had, you would definitely have accepted something from me. Keep in mind that before dying, he said he blamed no one. Pilate raised his finger meaningfully, his face convulsing and he would certainly have accepted something himself. You are cruel, and he was not. Where will you go? Suddenly, Levi approached the table, planted both hands on it, and gazing at the procurator with fiery eyes, whispered, No, Hegemon, that I will murder a certain man in Yerushalayim. I want to tell you this, so you'll know there will be more blood. I, too, know there will be, Pilate replied. Your words do nothing to surprise me. You wish to kill me, of course. I could never manage to kill you, Levi replied, baring his teeth in a smile. I am not so foolish as to expect that. But I will kill Judas of Kiriat. I will dedicate the remainder of my life to this. Bliss appeared in the procurator's eyes, and beckoning Matthew Levi closer with his finger, he said, Don't concern yourself. You will not be killing him. Judas was already killed this night. Gazing round savagely, Levi jumped back from the table and cried, Who did it? Don't be jealous, Pilate replied, grinning, and rubbed his hands together. I am afraid he had other fans besides you. Who did it? Levi repeated in a whisper. I did, Pilate said to him. Levi opened his mouth and glared savagely at the procurator, who said, It is not much, of course, but nonetheless I did it. He added, Now will you accept something from me? Levi thought about it, relented, and finally said, Have them give me a clean piece of parchment. An hour went by. Levi had left the palace. 
Only the quiet steps of the watchmen in the garden broke through the silence of the dawn. The moon was fading quickly, and the white spot of the morning star appeared on the other edge of the sky. The lamps had long since been extinguished. The procurator was lying on the couch, breathing noiselessly, with his hand under his cheek. He was asleep. Banga was sleeping beside him. Thus, the dawn of the fifteenth day of Nissan found the fifth procurator of Judea, Pontius Pilate.